to the Wrong Advice Podcast. I'm your host, John Picciuto, and I'm very, very excited to have my good buddy, Mr. Matt Lombardo, on with us today. Matt, how you doing, my friend? John, I'm great. Thanks for having me. We've been talking about doing this for quite some time. I think a year ago we started these conversations, so I'm glad we finally got the yeah. timing right. I've been looking forward to doing the pod for a while, and uh, really glad to be here. I'm uh, super excited to have you, Matt. Can you give a uh, quick introduction to the listeners on uh, who you are? Yeah, uh, I'm the senior NFL insider over at heavy.com. It's a role that I've been in since about last July. I've uh, covered the Giants for a couple of years before that. Long before that, covered the Philadelphia Eagles for various outlets, full-time at NJ.com for a year before moving over to the Giants beat. And I've done a little bit of everything in the industry. I've done sports talk radio in Philadelphia as a nights and weekends host, obviously covering the NFL and, you know, just, you know, really carving out a niche in terms of a, in that national reporter insider role. And it's been it's been a lot of fun and a fun climb up the career ladder to this point. That's awesome. How did you get your start? Like, was this something that you had a passion for in college? Were you, you know, a broadcasting major? How did this kind of all come to, to fruition? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I tell this story all the time. I've told it in job interviews that dating back to when I was four, five, six years old. My dad always listened to sports talk radio in the car. And I remember getting in the car to run errands with him, or I'd spend Saturday mornings in his office watching college football while he did work. And every time I got in the car, I'd be like, Hey, Dad, can we listen to Eagles talk? Can we listen to sports talk? And from that point on, I knew I wanted to get into sports talk radio, you know, going down the shore every summer growing up. One of the first things I do on the walk to the beach is grab a Philadelphia Daily News. And I remember being like 60 cents back in the day and thinking, you know, I want to be the guy that people turn to to read his opinion on the big trade or the big, you know, breaking sports story. And off we went. You know, I was a graduate of Westchester University back in 2009 and my first job out of school after being the sports editor of the paper and play-by-play announcer for the football and basketball team was I hosted the morning and the afternoon drive sports talk shows at a small little radio station that had to power down at sunset. They'd play the national anthem. True story. They'd play the national anthem at whatever time sunset was. If it was 517, your show ended at 517, and they powered off for the night. They had to do it legally. Uh, And then from there, did a little bit of everything. Sports updates on the ESPN radio affiliate in Atlantic City, writing for some blogs here and there. And Along the winding path we go, I wind up at 97.5 The Fanatic in Philadelphia as a producer, ultimately wind up on air there, hosted post-game for Flyers and Sixers games, post-post-Eagles games, and uh, the the writing track kind of was where it wound up leading me to the full-time opportunities, and that's where we are today. Yeah. When you sort of, you know, check off the career bucket list, right? Like you're doing the thing that you wanted to do since you were a little kid. How do you as a fan separate like fan affinity for work? Because I imagine those two things butt heads quite a bit. And, you know, I'm a diehard sports fan. I would find it very difficult to be biased at all. Yeah. <laughs> in, in, in reporting but how do you like sort of like separate the you know matt the fan and matt the writer matt the content creator who's the person who's in charge of like doing this for for a living? John, let me just dispel this right here because there's this huge notion across twitter that i'm some sort of like diehard eagles fan let me just put this to bed <laughs> right as soon as i walked into that eagles locker room for the first time as a beat writer and this had to be back what 2010 2011 right then i knew that my days being an nfl fan were over so i've really taken the the nfl fandom and put that up on a shelf and i've really channeled all of those fan emotions into penn state football where we have season tickets i make it up to four or five home games a year whenever my schedule allows me based around the nfl calendar the philadelphia phillies i'm a big phillies fan especially now with the run they just went on to the world series this year but but people, they can't seem to wrap their head around it, but I'm just not an NFL fan. I, I love the sport. I, I live for the storylines. I have relationships in yeah. buildings all around the league with agents who represent players who are on teams all around the league. And yeah, growing up, I was an Eagles fan. But if you sat down and watched the Super Bowl with me, you would have seen my father in his Eagles shirt, my, my wife wearing an Eagles jersey. And I was sitting there just kind of, as a as an observer tweeting as the game went along and and you know lining up content for the next day 
I really don't have that fan bone in my body when it comes to the NFL. And I know that some people do it differently, right? Like there are NFL reporters who still have their favorite team or whatever. I just, I can't get juiced up for those moments, and those opportunities uh, in the same way that fans do just by the way that I do my job from a relationship building and source building standpoint. Yeah. I mean, it's like uh, the separation of church and state, right? right? You got to like put the fandom to the side and like until your career is done, you know, you retire that Eagles hat and jersey and, and, and maybe, you know, 67, eight-year-old <laughs> Matt gets spring yeah, we'll see. <laughs> out of retirement. Hopefully. We'll see. And then, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe my dad takes my kids to a couple of games or whatever. But if they just grow up being big yeah. college sports fans, hey, that's fine. If they enjoy watching the NFL and they have favorite players around the league or on their fantasy team, more power to you. But it's just not, it's not a role and not an emotion that I have. That's cool. I appreciate that. I, you know, I'm kind of with you to as much as I am a diehard Giants fan and I love the NFL to me, college football is, well, it used to be football at its purest form. Obviously there's a lot more money involved with the nil stuff now. Um, but I'm with you um, as a Penn state fan. My brother graduated from Penn state. Um, I have a very interesting theory that I think, uh, listen, I think Penn state's a great school. I think they've got tons of resources. I personally, and this might be a bit uh, critical. Don't think that James Franklin is the guy who can take that program to the next level. Um, I don't know if that's a rational thought or if it's just sort of the college football world that we live in and the landscape doesn't allow for perhaps a Big Ten team to compete like that anymore. Um, what are your thoughts on the Penn State football crime program and, and like the future that it holds? Yeah, you know, what? I actually think the future has never been brighter for them. And, you know, full disclosure, James is a friend. But, you know, looking yeah. at, at their situation, I think it's been a tug of war between James Franklin and the administration to get the resources necessary to compete with the Michigans, the Ohio States, the Georgias, the Alabamas. And, you know, Kraft, mm -hmm. the new athletic director who was brought in this year, seems completely aligned in vision. They have multi-million dollar you know, facility upgrades in place that are underway. They just upgraded the weight room. They're upgrading the facilities coming up here. And it seems like they've really, um, after being way behind on NIL, I think they're emerging as one of the leading programs, developing those NIL relationships and opportunities for the players. I, I just don't think they ever had the quarterback in place up there. Now you have Drew Allard, who was the number one ranked quarterback nationally in 2022. They've Top two running backs in Nick Singleton and Katron Allen, a, a defense that's on the rise. I actually think that, you know, this this two-year window, 2023 and 2024 with Drew Alar, you're going to see some big things from Penn State. And I think that this is the window for them, not only to make the college football playoff, but I wouldn't be surprised if in 2024 we're talking about them in a national championship situation. I, I just think that James Franklin is recruiting at a higher level now. Manny Diaz is mm -hmm. an elite defensive coordinator with head coaching experience. Mike Yurkich, this is going to be his third year as the offensive coordinator, something they haven't had at Penn State for the last four or five years. There's been a lot of turnover there. So the talent, the coaching, and the money, most importantly, the money and the resources, John, coming from the, the rest of the university, I think has set the stage for them to kind of crack through into that elite tier. Well, I, I'm sure my brother is going to be very happy to hear that. Um, I do agree. The kid at quarterback they have is an outstanding talent. They're building a lot of solid pieces around him that can make them a big time threat in the Big Ten. Um, and you look at some programs in the SEC that are coming up and coming down and, you know, it's really hard to maintain that level. And, you know, there's always these ebbs and flows in college football programs peak and, and rise, at, you know, on a two to four year basis i went to west virginia from 04 to 08 saw probably the best run in mountaineer football history save for like the you know early 80s um it's 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 the best sport in my opinion on earth i i love it dearly and it's just the pageantry the camaraderie just everything about it is just gets my juices flowing like as a you know high school football player is the yeah, best like the atmosphere. um you know you look at going to a penn state whiteout and there's 110,000 people and it's not just people dressed in white i mean it's when you walk into that building for the whiteout game like you're a legitimate part of that experience and you're a part of the outcome in that game i think it was five false start penalties on minnesota's first two possessions i mean the noise is real the passion is real and that happens in a lot of places tuscaloosa you know you look at the the swamp when the gators are relevant like the atmosphere in college football is so antithetical to what you see in the nfl on sundays don't get me wrong nfl sunday crowds are great 
but the crowds at college football games are part of the game, and, and there's nothing that can really yeah. replicate that in sports, in my opinion. Oh, I completely agree. I'm curious, how do you think James Franklin was able to turn Penn State from like linebacker you to running back you? Because like the string of running backs that they've had through that program, you know, dating back probably to just eh, maybe even before Saquon, but the the run of RBs that they've been able to get through that program has been astonishing. And that's not even to any detriment <laughs> to their linebacking quarter either. But how do you think he's been able to attract such high level running back talent to that? Yeah, program? I, I think you hit the nail on the head. He flipped Saquon Barkley, who was originally committed to Rutgers. When you get a Saquon Barkley into that program, and then you can walk into Miles Sanders' living room, who was the number one prospect in the state of Pennsylvania in that recruiting cycle and say, hey, look what I just, look at Saquon, what he's doing. You're going to be better than him. You know, you bring in Miles Sanders and all of a sudden you have Nick Singleton fall into your lap, who was the number one running back in the country last year in that recruiting cycle. And you bring in Katron Allen and you had Noah Kane before that. I mean, it's, you're right. It's become a bit of a running back pipeline. I don't know that they've had the same success that, say, the University of Georgia has. But, man, it, Miles Sanders just played in a Super Bowl. If, right. if, if Nick Singleton is a, a top five draft pick in two years and Katron Allen is a top ten draft pick in two years, I, I kind of put Georgia and Penn State in that running back U conversation kind of neck and neck. So I think that it's when, when you start to have those household names – that get drafted early, that helps you walk into those top tier prospects of that position in the coming years and build on that pipeline. You mentioned linebacker, Micah Parsons. You know, Abdul Carter is there now as a five star top 10 linebacker in the country, walking in as a sophomore. So they have a lot of talent at some key positions. I think it's just a matter of developing it and getting these guys drafted year after year that allows you to go and target the top prospects of the position for years and years and years. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You have a clear and undeniable passion for the sport. I'm curious, did you play growing up? Was football a big part of your youth? Yeah, I played for two years, and I was a blocking tight end who couldn't block at the 80-pound uh, and under league, or, you know, weighing it at a, at a soaking wet 58 pounds. Like, I was the scrawny kid growing up. Like, that was me. And uh, so I didn't really play football growing up, but football's always just been such a big part of my upbringing and my family, my dad and I watching Penn State on Saturday and the Eagles on Sunday with family. And that was kind of how it always was. And growing up in the Philadelphia area, very similar to the North Jersey and New York era, area up there. I'm sure it's a lot of Yankees, but the Giants as well. But, you know, the football kind of is in your blood growing up. And I think that that's kind of what fueled it for me. And also on the journalism side of things, like I realized pretty quickly I was not going to be an elite athlete. It just wasn't going to happen for me to make the pros, but I wanted to be around sports. I, I had a passion for sports journalism and I followed that. And I've been fortunate enough in my career to carve out a path where, especially at the juncture I am now covering Super Bowls and at a place like Heavy, where they've really built a department around me. It, it, it's it's a very, you know, rewarding and, and, and valuable uh, path to be on. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I mean, a big part of my life now is storytelling, whether it's through photography, whether it's through this podcast. Um, I relate to that tremendously. Just being able to dive into a subject matter, uh, person, place, thing, whatever it might be, and being able to elicit any sort of emotion from a person who interacts with that story is is important to me. I I, I do it with my pictures and I do it with this podcast. Um, when you're pitching ideas, when you're creating um, something that you want to tell a story about, what is things, you know, people in uh, themes that jump out at you that you look at and say, this will make something uh, for a compelling story that I would like to tell and, and I would see other people um, like to read about? Yeah, you know what? I, if I have a weakness in my career, John, I think that that might be it. Because I think that, you know, I'm, I'm one of those type of bulldog reporters where if you pitch me an idea, I'm going to go get it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm going to chase it oh. down and I'm going to get the best angle that you can. Admittedly, those ideas don't always come quickly to me. Maybe it's because you're looking at it from that 30,000 foot, all 32 teams in the NFL perspective. But I, I like kind of when I do have the opportunity to chase those stories, I like looking for the guy who has emerged as the leader, the guy who stepped up, like what made him tick? What makes him have the ability to get guys to follow him on that locker room in big moments in games? Those are the sort of things that I go after. 
and love to tell those stories. But admittedly, I think I'm good at a lot of things. I think that I've been able to get to a point in my career from a relationship building standpoint and just working hard. But admittedly, those storylines, they don't always come easy to me. That's not always a strength of mine uh, in my career. Yeah, there are, in my opinion, there's like two different kind of sports reporters. There are the newsbreakers like the Schefters and the Rappaports of the world who are breaking immediate stories as they happen. And then there are like long form creators who are diving into the, the nitty gritty, like you mentioned, like find, finding compelling figures, telling their stories. I've always sort of uh, been drawn to people who are telling stories. I mean, obviously, a great Twitter follow is Rappaport or Schefter to know what's going on in the league as a whole. But to me, I was drawn to your work very early on back when you were writing for NJ.com. I think it was with the Giants, obviously, because you were beat writing for them. There was an easy follow for me because it, the, the way in which you. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a short list. Man. <laughs> uh, it's the local paper and it's my team. So it's just, you're two it. for two in that regard. Um, but yeah, so like I, I was drawn to your work and then obviously it was a, a, a logical Twitter follow and it just became like a, a nice Internet friendship that we developed. But to me, like I said, I, I've always found myself sort of gravitating towards storytellers people who are going to go beyond the surface area of what a story may be um, and that's something that I like quite a bit about your job um, as the landscape of sports media changes tremendously into more video more podcasting how do you find the avenues that you think make best for what you do as a reporter um, like it, it just to me can be immensely overwhelming I mean here we are doing a video podcast and I started a podcast because it was audio but there being that the the landscape of the NFL is, is changing significantly in the media world. How do you sort of, you know, define your path um, for what you yeah, I don't think we could have timed this interview any better, John, this conversation any better, because in my my new role, I'm in my new deal with Heavy uh, that we signed at the beginning of the month, you know, we're transitioning into almost exclusively podcast and video with a little bit of writing on the side and maybe a big column or two every week. And of course, some reporting, that's going to be the bedrock of all of it. But I think that, you know, in, in my medium, in this role that I'm currently in, it's about finding, OK, here's the story that just broke. How do we advance it further? How do we put our spin on that story? So I'll just give you an example. You know, Adam Schefter reports today that the Cowboys and Ezekiel Elliott, the Ezekiel Elliott's agents are going to figure out their future during the NFL combine and get a sense of their value while they're in Indianapolis. Well, I start asking around and talk to some agents who represent running backs, talk to some people from teams around the league to get a sense for what are they hearing on Ezekiel Elliott's situation? What's next for Zeke? What is his value? Is he going to go back to the Cowboys? We heard these whispers about a potential pay cut or a restructure. What does that look like? See, I, I think that where I really thrive and where I provide a lot of value is that I'm connected enough on multiple fronts, sources, in buildings, former players, that when a story happens, I think one of my biggest strengths is being able to advance it and being able to advance it in video form, spending a segment talking about it on the podcast. And where I think Heavy is now doing a really nice job is they've found a way to take videos, you know, 90 second, two minute, three minute video clips of me or whoever providing their analysis on a story and embedding them into article posts. And, and you're kind of down a dual revenue path at that point. So that's what I'm really excited about doing moving forward from here. And I think it presents a real opportunity for content creators in the space to kind of replicate and do it that way if you have the ability to. That's cool. I like that. Um, obviously, you've had a lot of different experience in a 10 plus year career in sports media, you know, from traditional media outlets like the NJ.coms of the world and and papers and such. How in, you know, you just signed a new deal with Heavy Sports. How do you figure out who's the right partner for Matt Lombardo? How do you figure out who that strategic partner is going to be from a job perspective? Because in a world where someone with a large Twitter following, someone with a significant social media following can sort of develop their own platform. How do you know who to partner with for yourself? Yeah, John, I'll say this, you know, coming into heavy and, and signing with them initially last July, I've never felt more valued in my career because, you know, from the first conversations that I had with the sports editor, the NFL director, the CEO of the company, there was a clear vision there. And I think that our goals really aligned in terms of not only 
putting talent in the best position to succeed because they're going to ultimately find success. But they do a really great job of leveraging social media and digital media into profits in a landscape where you look at what's happening all across the sports media landscape with companies laying off people and jobs getting slashed and roles getting eliminated. They really are investing in talent. And, and that excites me because they have a vision on how to maximize that talent. And they went from being an aggregation house and they still do some aggregation to wanting to take that next step into original reporting and build their NFL operation around me and my reporting. And when you have an outlet who's willing to throw that kind of commitment behind you financially and otherwise, John, I'm telling you, I have never felt more valued. I've worked at some mainstream outlets, like you said, at, at NJ.com, you know, 97.5 in Philly, Sports Talk Radio. I, I've never found a place to be more innovative or invested in their people and their talent than heavy. And I couldn't be happier to be here. That's pretty fucking cool. Yeah. I like that a lot. I'm genuinely curious with, you know, that sort of great amount of responsibility. Do you ever struggle with things like imposter syndrome, things like um, maybe? Yeah. 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 I mean, I'll, I'll tell you a story. You know, a year and a half ago, I was interviewing for a couple of major roles at significant outlets, legacy outlets. And there were thoughts in my head all the time. Is this above my head? Is this above my pay grade? Is that something that I'd be able to even handle? And yeah, like it's a real thing. The because you don't want to be into a trap, you don't want to fall into a trap where you feel like you're overexposing yourself, or that somebody's making a commitment to you that you can't live up to. And I've just gotten to the point now where I'm pretty good at this. I'm pretty well connected. I know my limits. I tell sources all the time. Listen, I know the scoop is probably going to go to. Adam Schefter, Ian Rappaport, but hey, if there, you have speculation news or you have like stuff that could generate buzz or rumors, even informed rumors, that's where I can live and I can thrive. So you have to kind of know your your limitations and, and go a thousand miles an hour and do the best work that you can within those limitations while trying to push through those limitations. But yeah, I mean, there, there have been moments where I've questioned a lot of things about myself when maybe I, I, I was wrong too. And I don't think that it cost me the opportunity at those other outlets because I finished in the top three or four for both of those positions. But during the interview process, I certainly went through some of that imposter, imposter syndrome. There's no doubt about that. It's a real thing. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it, we live in a world where at the click of a button, you can compare yourself to a hundred people um, as a person who's creating content around beautiful people, um, you're constantly big fan of your work, measuring yourself. Against. Big fan of your work. The stuff you throw oh, on thanks. social, I, I, I love checking it out. I'm a big fan. You do a nice job. Thank you. I appreciate that. But it's like very easy to get lost in the sauce of social media where it's I'm not getting enough likes or I'm not getting enough views. And, and it's like can be to the detriment of the thing that I'm putting Why do my to, which is to get take such photos or engagement than this person who has fewer followers. We, we've all been there. right? We all get we all get sucked into it a little bit. Yeah, it's it's it sucks. It's like the the you know cliche catch twenty two of social media, where it can be this tremendously powerful tool to forward yourself, and at the same time, it could be the thing that just like detriments you to be wrapped up in why is it not me? You know, it's it's the double edged sort of social media. Um, but for 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 you, uh, when you look at the, the fact that you've got a company that's investing a lot of time behind you, do you look at like the the personalization of it as Matt Lombardo and the the number attached to your name as tertiary because you have that security with the partnership that you have with Heavy? Does it look at is it like a thing that you concentrate at all about anymore? It's more about just doing the work. I used to be obsessed with Twitter followers. Like I used to be obsessed with how my work was perceived on social and the engagement. And, and there are times where I'll count the retweets or I'll look at how many impressions that a, a tweet has gotten. You have to, right? Because that's the only way that you figure out what your audience is after and, and what your audience wants to read or see or hear about. But it, it's gotten to the point now with all the resources that Heavy is throwing behind me, as supportive as they have been since my arrival there, that I'm not driven by the retweets and the likes. They're nice, and it's always easy to see when a podcast or a video clip or an article goes viral. But I think that I'm, I find more, what's the word I'm looking for here, validation in the amount of people who are reading the work or the amount, because there's a very public scoreboard on some of these 
articles, every article at Heavy, it shows like how many reads, how many shares. So the stuff that I'm really proud of, I, I take great pride in knowing that I did the best work that I could. And obviously, if it's received well within the industry, that helps. But there are certain times when you're looking at that scoreboard and you're like, man, that, that really took off and I'm happy about that. Or you'll write something great and it'll get 200 views and you're like, well, why is that? But, you know, that that's where I think yeah. that social media might cheapen what we do a little bit because you could take it, you personally, you could take it an artistically incredible, amazing photo that you put on Twitter and you're proud of that photo and it gets 100 impressions. But the, the thing that you snap yeah. with your iPhone at sunset because it's a cool sunset and that gets 20,000 impressions, it, you almost have to train yourself to realize it's the algorithm that's driving those things, not the quality of work. But that it's a battle we all struggle with as creators, right? Yeah. You know, the, the, the someone I, I read recently or, or, or saw probably on a TikTok. Why am I lying and saying I read it? I saw it on a TikTok. <laughs> it's true, though. <laughs> the... The thing that's fucked up about social media that we can't really understand or grasp anymore is like if I get 100 likes on something, that doesn't seem like a lot. But if I put 100 people in my apartment, no one could fucking move. Right. right? So our means in which we measure. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not not in my studio. Uh, just like logically like uh very long ago i I used to write for this outlet uh, elite daily um and i wrote an article that went super viral and it was like it's embarrassing now looking back on it it's such trash but i it got a million likes on facebook and i was like holy shit that is like an insane number and i think to the detriment of my own ability to measure success though because everything i do now is warped to well it's not a million so who cares right and i think there is that sort of uh context that we need to be able to frame success on these platforms because if you have a thousand likes on something you put a thousand people in a room you can build a huge hugely successful brand with a thousand people but we're just so blinded by that number of we need millions that it's it's difficult to sort of frame success in a way other than yeah, it's tough to really measure success based on social media and, and as much as you and i create as many articles and podcasts and video posts that i'm putting out on a daily basis a weekly basis basis a monthly basis same with you you almost have to treat it as every photo is a step in a marathon right like Every podcast is a step in a marathon. Not everything needs to win a Grammy Award or win a Pulitzer. It's nice to win some Pulitzers along the way, or at least in your own mind, realize that you did great fucking work in that case. You know what I mean? But I think that needs to be the validation rather than, hey, this got like what one person with 50,000 Twitter followers retweeted this and now it has 150,000 likes. I think we have to get ourselves out of that mindset and refocus on the quality of the work that you're putting out and realizing the difference between what's quality and what's just you checking a box. And you don't want to check a box every time, right? You want to put out the best quality you can, but you have to have the understanding that, hey, not everything is going to be your best work. As long as you try to do your best in that moment, to me, that's all you can do. I really like that. I think that's crucially important, especially with, you know, you work a long year, right? Like it doesn't it's, end. Right? <laughs> Yeah, June, yeah. June, June, really, June, in the news, like might be the off month, right? Like you take, you cram all your vacations into June because July you got training camp and then the preseason and you're off to the races. But even with you, you know, you, you take a great photo, you know, just because John Cena doesn't retweet it, you know what I'm saying? Or, or <laughs> you know, it, it follows me. me too. I think he's been on a following spree lately of journalists and creators. But, but yeah. you know, you know what I'm saying though? <laughs> if one person retweets it, now it's in the cycle and it's going to get. You know what I mean? Yeah. You almost can't judge yourself on the likes because sometimes it all takes is one person to put it into their ecosphere for it to get those likes. But that's not always a, a, a measure of the quality of the work. Totally. I've I've I talk about this a lot on the podcast because I interview a lot of creative people, whether they're photo journalists, whether they're photographers, musicians, whatever. It is something that I try to wrap my brain around, not forcing something to be to live in a certain way. I'm I'm thankful that, you know, I'm 37 years old. I have reached a comfort in my creativity and my creative process that I didn't have two years ago. So just in the ease in which I'm able to create now, I take solace in the fact that I'm creating the best work of my life. I know that a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, it's going to fall into the hands of the people that I want it to. 
But I, it, that's a, the 37 year old's brain, the 25 year old. I could never have imagined that. At 25, um, you know, you're chasing a legacy, right? At 25, I'm desperate to hold that ESPN mic, uh, microphone flag, Matt Lombardo ESPN. You know what I mean? But at this point, when you've carved out a niche, you've carved out a role where you've, you, you do pretty well for yourself at an outlet that cares about you and values you and is invested in your success. I don't need to go to an ESPN or a Fox Sports or a CBS Sports to feel validated. I, I, I feel like I'm at, if this is the destination for me, I, I want to be paid and I want to be valued. And not necessarily in that order. I mean, you look at what's happening at these bigger outlets and these bigger legacy media companies. I have a family to support now. I don't know that I want to swim in those uncertain waters if I know that a place is going to invest in me, allow me to do my best work. To me, that, that, that's a pretty great spot to be. It's a pretty sweet spot. Oh, absolutely. I completely agree. I think, at, at the, and that's, again, it comes with age, right? You have to be able to put yourself in a position to provide when, you know, 10 years ago, you were probably chasing the flag, right? You yeah. wanted to have that. I get that completely. Um, it is a long season. It's just ended a week ago. How do you deal with the the length, the breadth of an NFL season? It can be a lot. You're working crazy hours, weird hours. Stories break all times a day. Unfortunately, sometimes at night, DUIs, terrible shit. How do you deal with like just the cacophony of of experiences that go on over the course of the year without burning out and and? Oh, there's a lot of burnout. I mean, there, there are a lot of st- <laughs> seriously. There there are a lot of stretches where. You know, it's it's a Thursday in week 12 and you just don't have it. You know what I mean? Like you, you need to recognize that you're burnt out. You need to realize when you can push through being burnt out. And you know, this is the wrong advice podcast, but some of the best advice that I've gotten is from <laughs> Doug Farrar, who's a good friend over at USA Today, runs Touchdown Wire. And, you know, he told me in Indy the one time, hey, burnout's a real thing. But you need to know when you personally are capable of pushing through it and writing through it and working through it. And when you just need to put your hands up and go outside and smoke a cigar, or my buddy has, my buddy's a poker pro and he has a golf simulator in his garage that he built. I got to know when I need to take three hours and go play Augusta on the, the golf simulator or hit a bucket of balls, you know, um, or, or go play with my kids or, or go take my wife out to dinner or cook or whatever it is just to turn off for a couple of hours. And, you know, my, my week to week is pretty interesting the NFL has off on Tuesdays, but Tuesday I'm writing my big 2,500 omnibus around the league column that goes live on Wednesday mornings. I genius in me decided that was also the best day to record my podcast every week on Tuesdays. So Tuesdays become the busy day, the hell day, if you will. So by nature, Wednesday, barring some sort of breaking news, that might be my day to be like, okay, hands off. I'm taking my kid to the playground today. Like I need that or else by week, six of on a Wednesday, I'm going to be fried. You know what I mean? So you just have to build in little breaks for yourself. I go to four or five Penn State games a year, and that's a Saturday where I let loose. And Sunday, you're watching all the games on TV or in the stadium somewhere. You just have to realize what your own limitations are and what your own abilities are in those burnout situations and whether you can fight through them or you need to take a step back and do something else for a couple hours. And usually you know, the, being in Happy Valley or the playground or cooking a nice meal or smoking a cigar or playing virtual golf, usually that'll get me back where I need to be by the next day. That's cool. I like that. I think being able to know when you need to pull back, it's it's crucial to success. I think if you can have that sort of mental capacity to be like, whoa, I'm, this is going to be a problem. I need to take a minute. And you can pre- <laughs> <laughs> pre-realize that that, that could be to, great right? like i'm sure um, if you can stand, very... right if you if you have a, a busy schedule or, or you know two days worth of editing there's got to be moments where if if you're going through the editing process and it's too much that if you try to go out and shoot that next day you're not going to be at your best right so i think you almost need to society tells us we need to work 80 hours a week every single week and push 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 but eventually that rubber band snaps and I just try to the best I can mm-hmm. try to manage that rubber band, not snapping or at least not snapping in the middle of a season because then you're fucked. Yeah. I think that's a great metaphor. I like, I'm going to say that rubber band snapping. I like that. Um, you've obviously had the, the, the privilege of covering a lot of, you know, great stories of the 10 plus years that you've been in the industry. Um, do you have any dream podcast guests, dream profiles to write any sort of, you know, pie in the sky, 
this would make my career, this would be a dream scenario for yourself? That's really interesting because, you know, I don't get really get starstruck. You know what I mean? Like I don't really have, at least on the NFL side of things. Um, I mean, if going outside of sports, you know, if I could get Bruce Springsteen or Barack Obama on a podcast, I think that would be, I mean, that would check a lot of boxes for me. Yeah. It would be a bucket list type of situation. Um, man, that, Bruce might be easy. He's more accessible, I feel like. Yeah. Nils Lofgren and I, one of the guitarists in the E Street Band, I mean, we DM back and forth from time to time. So there's the connection, right? Like, Nils, put a bug in Bruce's ear. Come on, come on. Um, You got to start with Nils, so then you hope that Bruce sees it. You know, it's like, yeah. Um, Yeah. But as far as the NFL goes, I mean, would it be great to interview Tom Brady or Gronk? Of course, it would be great to interview Tom Tom Brady or Gronk. But the chances of you getting those guys, is, the only way it's going to be is in a car wash situation where they're doing 30 different media availabilities the same day that they're on with you. So what are you really getting out of it? But um, I, I guess my bucket list is just to keep keep churning out quality content, keep keep being a, a figure of the moment that people turn to and find relevant, both in terms of my opinions, my takes, and the information that I'm willing and able to, able is probably the better word, the information that I'm able to bring to the public. That's that's my goal. Stay relevant and, and stay top of mind for people. I like that. Um, as a primary writer to now a multifaceted media personality person, um, do you have any ideas about maybe writing a book is there anything in development is there anything along those lines that you have put that, the that's seeds always into been a bucket list item of mine is to write a book um there are a couple of ideas that i've percolated on you know over the years and uh may, maybe 60 year old matt in 20 30 years you know I'm, I'm 36 so maybe in uh gosh what are we talking 24 years maybe i'll get to sit down and uh and write that book when everything else kind of slows down a little bit. How about you? Do you have well, any that, projects in development, John? I am. I'm writing a screenplay right now, and uh, it's it's proving to be hard. Well, it's so much harder than I thought. Um, I like I've always been like a a writer. I use the term writer in with air quotes because what I used to put out was garbage trash dog shit but i have a really good story in mind and i put an outline together and now the process of turning the outline into the screenplay is proving to be incredibly difficult um it's it's just finding the time to want to do it number one i've just been busy with life right podcasting photography it's just like there's a lot of hours in the day and a lot of them are (laughs) allocated already um so the hours that i could put towards it i would rather sit on my couch watch a movie and drink a bourbon than write and that's right I I mean, you know you're, you're writing yeah. you're on camera you're you're picking the phone and talking to sources all the time where do you schedule in the time to write and write well i mean that that to me that's the conundrum and i had a conversation with a colleague of mine in phoenix who wrote a book not so re- not so long ago and it kind of changed the conversation for me because i envision having to sit down with the blank screen and type out you know 150,000 words at once but apparently some publicists and some publishers, they just have you write it chapter by chapter by chapter. That might eventually make it a little bit easier for me to have that undertaking. But writing a screenplay, that's that's fascinating. I, I would be I would be all in on reading that screenplay and hopefully seeing the movie. <laughs> oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. I, uh, I I say a lot, you know, my life is a complete and open book. I like tell it like it is. I, I don't believe that there needs to be any like bullshit about who I am or what I am. And like, I live my life openly because I hope that something that I've experienced or gone through can positively impact you. another person, or maybe they can learn a lesson. It's like a do as I say, not as I do thing. I've fucking made so many mistakes in my life, hence the wrong advice podcast. But to that degree, like I hope someone hears something that I say and be like, man, that's fucking dumb. I don't want to do that. But I have a good story, and I think it would – it's not like a personal story. I mean, it is, but it's like – it's – I don't know. It, it make for a good nice. rom-com. It'll, it'll be good. It'll, it, it'll be worth the 90 minutes probably, of probably screen on, time if I write it sometime. The red carpet premiere. You know, make, make sure I'm there. Done. I'll tweet about uh, it. We're, it'll be in New Jersey, so it's <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, no, um, it's it's good. I, I think in when you reach a certain age, I don't have. I'm not married. I don't have kids. I like allocating my time towards creative endeavors, whether it's this podcast, whether it's my career. 
And writing is just an extension of that. Um, for yourself, do you have any other creative pursuits outside of your day to day job or it, when you're not doing content creation or writing or producing or whatever it is you're doing? Do you like to just like, you know what? I like to sit and sip a, a glass of scotch. That's what I like to do. Or, or, or go play with the kids to take my daughter okay. to the playground or, you know, my, my son does the cutest thing now. Like I, they take turns taking baths, right? So my daughter will be in the bath and my mm -hmm. son will be in the hallway. He's seven months old and I'll be doing push-ups. I'll be doing like 25 sets of 25 sets of 15, whatever. And he'll sit there and he'll try to like push himself up. So, so moments like that are like an escape for me because you have that creative mind going all the time and you're creating all the time that it's hard for me to, you know, take time to create something else outside of, of work and, and, and my career. But I, I certainly applaud people like you who can record a podcast, have this extensive photography portfolio, and then decide, hey, just for the hell of it, I'm going to write a screenplay. I mean, that's amazing. It's, it's incredible. I just wish that I had that energy. I don't have I don't. I sleep a lot more than you do, Matt. And, and I don't know. I'm not providing for, I have no dependence. I tell people all the time, like, oh, you do so much shit. It's so cool. I'm like, yeah, I have zero dependence. Like, yeah, if you have no dependence, yeah. you do a lot more too. That's funny. I like that. <laughs> when, uh, <laughs> when the season wraps and you sort of take a, uh, uh, an, an inventory stock on like what you produced this year from an article perspective, from a podcast perspective, are there any stories that you created over the last, you know, call it a year that, uh, jump out in your mind as something you're super like, uh, you know, I'm just you know proud of what, what dropped on yesterday coming off of the Super Bowl um, with Patrick Mahomes winning his second Super Bowl MVP, his second Super Bowl in three trips. You know, I, I picked up the phone and I started calling around. I talked to six of the Hall of Fame selectors who were in the room deciding who gets in the Hall of Fame and who doesn't. And I asked a simple question. If Patrick Mahomes falls in love with Disneyland and decides that he's just going to move into Walt Disney's old apartment above the Disneyland Fire Company, and never plays another down, does he get in? And I thought that that was, he does. Yes. And, and the, the consensus was that of the six people I talked to, four of them said it would be on the first ballot. All six said he would ultimately get in. But, yeah. but that's something I was really proud of because I hadn't seen anybody yet tackle it from that sort of firsthand sourced perspective. So I really enjoyed writing that column. Um, a couple years ago, I wrote a great feature on Jamar Chase and why people inside the league believe that he has all pro Hall of Fame potential. That was at a different outlet before I got to heavy. Um, but I, I, I really enjoy writing the column every Wednesday because it gives you the couple of days to kind of digest the biggest developments from Sunday's games, look ahead to what's happening the next Sunday. And um, it gives me a chance to kind of introduce myself and talk to people around the entire NFL and build relationships based on whatever I'm writing. But I think if you ask me what I was most proud of, it's probably probably the story that I just wrote coming out of the Super Bowl in Phoenix. That's great. Great way to end the season. That's pretty cool. Um, I am a big, dumb, irrational Giants fan. I have the most supreme confidence in sure? Joe Shane and Brian well. Dable. I think what they're... I, I agree. I uh, I also irrationally have already decided to place a bet on the Giants win the Super Bowl next year. 4, I feel like they are great, you got great odds, right? Yeah, great odds. Yeah, I mean, I didn't win money on the Super Bowl, so like from between what I bet and then what I won back, I like I think I lost like two hundred bucks or something. So I took my winnings and I just dumped it on the Giants win the Super Bowl because I'm I, you know done. Big dumb irrational Giants fan. Um, but that being said. Talk to me. Give me some early spoilers for next year. Who do you think are going to be some surprise teams that may be um, jumping to the next level? Or, you know, what What are your early uh, 2023 seasons? Yeah, I think the Chicago Bears are going to be fascinating because I'm a believer in Justin Fields. I think he has the ability to be a franchise quarterback, and he showed you glimpses of that down the stretch. They have the most cap space of anybody in the NFL. Talking to people down in Mobile, there's a sense that they could trade back from one to two and then two to four, trade back twice get three first round picks next year, some additional picks this year to really build out that nucleus around fields and get a great defensive player at number four to kind of anchor that defense. So the Bears to me are one of those teams that could sneak into the postseason. A lot of times we see those like worst to first, like the Giants this year. I think the Bears could be that worst to first team. I think the Giants are a team that could win one or two oh, rounds yeah. next year. I think it all depends on whether Daniel Jones takes another step, but you know, Barring some major changes this offseason, John, 
I think it's going to be a really familiar final four or final six next year because I think for the Eagles, their four is the NFC championship game because they have a top 10 quarterback, maybe a top five quarterback in Jalen Hurts. Their roster is still going to be pretty deep. I think in the AFC, it's going to be the Chiefs, the Bengals, and the Jaguars. I think the Bills might come back to earth a little bit, but they're going to be in the mix as well. I just think you look around the NFL, I think that the cream is starting to separate itself from the rest of the league. But listen, we could be doing this podcast in February of next year after the Bills beat the Commanders or something completely friggin' ridiculous like that, you know? <laughs> That's the beauty of this. Nobody well, really knows. It depends you know? if he's going to spy or not, yeah. right? <laughs> it's a big depending right. on if Snyder sells the team or not, um, whether they'll be relevant beyond it's scandals. <laughs> but yeah. No, I think that's what's nice. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think that's what's nice about the NFL for as much as you said, there is that like sort of distinguishing line between the cream of the crop and the second tier teams. Yeah, Anything can happen. I mean, for all of the joking aside, I know everyone was talking about how the Chiefs were, um, you know, the underdog, but they were, were a fucking really good team and they've been in the Super Bowl. What is it? Three of the last four years. Hard to say that they're they were an underdog in any frame of mind but it's a quarterback driven league if you've got a guy like hurts behind quarterback uh, you know behind the center or or mahomes or, or, you know Trevor. It, it's yeah. it's easy to be there's a million of them right i so if you have the guy behind center and i think that's my only concern daniel jones was lights out this year i have zero questions about if he can maintain this and be better but you know there's a reason why his fifth year option wasn't picked up and it's just my hope that like he was young, he's young he's got plenty of room to grow so you look at what he did this year if he's able to have another year in the system with Kafka that they can build on these um, the successes that they had this yeah, year and I think that's that, my hope you know they have the cap space they have the resources to go out and get some players two really difficult decisions when it comes to Daniel Jones and to Saquon Barkley and to me John it just comes down to if they're moving forward with Jones They have to go get him NFL caliber receivers. I mean, you look at the Eagles going out and getting, right, no doubt. The Eagles went out and got A.J. Brown. To a bit of a lesser extent, you look at the Jaguars bringing in Christian Kirk, and everybody laughed at the contract. But you look up at the end of the year and the stretch run that Christian Kirk had, he was instrumental in Trevor Lawrence taking a big leap. The Bengals pairing Joe Burrow with Jamar Chase. The Bills going out and getting Stephon Diggs. If you're going to build around a young quarterback, you need to get him a legitimate weapon. And right now the Giants, everybody wants to talk about Ricky James, and it's a nice story. They don't have an NFL wide receiver court. They need to go get him at least one NFL wide receiver. And then I think the Giants could be cooking with gas because that defense, especially with Wink Martindale staying in place, there's a lot of talent there. The offensive line is getting better. You have two bookends at tackle. They just need to put some weapons around Jones. And I think that they have, they have the ability to surprise some people next year. Well, listen, Matt, from your lips to God's ears, I've already put my money where my mouth is, so I hope you're correct. And I, and I do hope that uh, next February we do this again. I like I like the idea of having a uh, yearly recurrence of having you on. Um, it's been my pleasure having you on the podcast today, Matt. You know, obviously, you know, I'm a big fan of your work and all that you do. Um, I have an extremely cheesy line. If you've been on my podcast, you're part of my family. And uh, yeah, just thanks again for coming on, Matt. It's been my uh, thanks for having me. Really enjoyed it. And yeah, I'm all in on making it an annual uh, an annual survey of the NFL, an annual post mortem, if you will. It's been fun. (laughs) I love it. Thanks, buddy. Awesome.